Rolling. Yeah. It was super loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what have we got? Did we do an intro again? Yeah. Okay. So, like, hi, and welcome to episode two of the Arts District podcast with <laughs> Lauren and Georgia. <laughs> if you watched our last episode, we hope you liked it. Um, we're still trying to figure some things out, and we'll be making adjust adjustments probably constantly as we go just to see what we like and what we don't like but the content will remain pretty consistent um just to bring you up to speed if you didn't catch episode one georgia was talking about digital art auctions and some cool things going on at the ago and what else did I? You talked about the theme parks. Oh yeah, I was talking about cultural stuff and visitor numbers. Cultural shift is yeah. that what you call it? Yeah. Um, Warren was talking <laughs> about uh, Heim and the Walkervilles. Which, if you remember, Georgia hadn't heard Heim yet, and I gave her a CD to listen to, and she says she's hooked. Yeah, so, I've been listening to it constantly. So, so it just goes to show that you should listen to Heim, too. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is episode two. Yeah! <laughs> and we have some more cool things to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about two more bands. And uh, one of them's from the States. They're called Lake Street Dive. And the other one is a band actually from Toronto called the Devin Cuddy Band. Cool. What do you got for us? I am going to talk about a book that I've been reading. Um, as well as being into fine art and stuff, I'm also into design, so it's kind of a design-related book about typography. And I just found a really cool thing in it about ampersands, so I'm a type nerd like that. Let's talk about and simple. <laughs> I like <laughs> ampersands. Like, if I'm writing, I'll use that yeah, little thing. Yeah, I think they're cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about that, and speaking of animated GIFs, or GIFs, as apparently they're actually called, which we figured out in our last episode, Yeah. Um, there's an art critic who's starting to write a fine art history of animated GIFs, so I wanted to mention that, and then I've got a couple things, online art auctions, as opposed to the digital art auction I was talking about last week. Um, okay, what should we start with this week? Um, I can start if you want. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that book. Yeah, so this came out a couple years ago. It's called Just My Type, and it's all about fonts. It's sort of like a popular, I think it was a bestseller or something. Such a Kim little design that. nerd. I know. Buying a book on fonts. I know, I just <laughs> walked into a bookstore and I was like, where's the arts and design slash photography section? And I found this. So it's by Simon Garfield, and there was a whole section on ampersands, which is the and symbol, and this book talks a lot about the history of typography, going back to like printing presses and Gutenberg's press, and like foundries that produced the little letters that went into all the printing presses and stuff, hmm. and there was a back and forth between a couple designs for ampersands. And I'll probably insert both of them. But it turns out that the ampersand, it it's an amalgamation of an E and a T. Kind of so like et, et, which et. is Latin oh. for and. Well, so it's also French. It's also French. A. Yeah. I think it's pronounced A. I know. I'm just saying words. Yeah. But yeah, A. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a couple versions of the ampersand, and I will place them somewhere. The bubble. Yeah. <laughs> um... So one is sort of like a large loopy E and it comes up with a tail and has a T that crosses. And then the other is sort of what I'm more familiar with that's like kind almost of like a like treble clef. S. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like a handwritten S yeah. and then like it crosses itself as the T. So they've kind of moved away from being the E-T. But I thought that was a really interesting history. That is, I didn't yeah. know that. And then there's, it goes on to talk about um, the importance of the ampersand in design. Um, it's sort of 
signifies something more permanent, like in business drawings, right? Like Dean and DeLuca uses an ampersand, and Ben and Jerry's uses an ampersand. Whereas like, Simon and Garfunkel was the word and, <laughs> and they broke up. That's like exactly what they said in this book. What's H and M? I think it's an and, like the ampersand. Yeah. But I don't know. Don't you think the H and the M both stand for something? Probably. Probably. It's probably the founder's initials or something Yeah, like something that. like that. So I thought that was really interesting. And if you notice in our logo, I put in an ampersand. It's Lauren ampersand Georgia. We will not be <laughs> doomed for failure because yeah. we had the word and in yeah. our name. So I thought that was really cool. That's though. neat. Can I see the book actually? Yeah. So was this something you would sit down and read like a novel or is it more like you would pick it up if you were needing to read something <laughs> about fonts. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I think this is so funny. Right. Um, I've been, I started out reading it like novel and I found it was a lot to take in at once. It's like a textbook. So it is a little bit like a textbook, but it has sort of interesting anecdotes and funny essays and stuff about specific fonts or about specific font creators. Mm -hmm. um, so it's cool and like the uses of different fonts. So do you know why Times New Roman is kind of like the the go-to font when you open Such up Microsoft font. Word? Like, is it just because it's easy to read or is there some, like, science behind it? Yeah. <laughs> there were some, like, not very scientific studies conducted um, about readability and about clarity and design of fonts in, like, the 50s or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty much they found that we're speediest and most comfortable reading the fonts that we recognize and see most often. So like the more you read a different font that's new to you, the easier it'll be to read it. So Times New Roman just sort of like floated to the top because it was used so commonly and became so dominant. Right. It's kind of the same with Helvetica. Like Helvetica has become a massive, th like, it's literally on everything. Yeah. You can't live a day in the world <laughs> without reading Helvetica font, so. Jeez. And it is so legible, in part because it's so used in every day, everything. And then you have Comic Sans, which should just be avoided at all costs. Yeah. There's actually an essay in this book about Comic Sans <laughs> and how it was started. Um, the guy actually created it for a Microsoft program in like the late 80s or early 90s yeah. that was supposed to be a super user-friendly program and I think they ended up like it was too late in production of the program so they put out this program with Times New Roman which made the whole thing feel a lot less user-friendly mm. whereas Comic Sans would have made it like super friendly yeah so Comic Sans was really just intended for one thing for a sort of childish feeling program right. and then it just became this huge thing and everyone started using it because yeah. it was such a friendly font. I used it in MSN Messenger back in the day when that was a big thing. Nice. And that was like my go-to font. Yeah. I also really like that Lucida one. A Lucida it's brand like, or whatever. Yeah. And it's like a sort of sort of handwritten. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 It's like exactly. fancy. Yeah. I don't know. Terrible. Jeez. Back in the day. Yeah. There's a, some websites where you can like download fonts that are really original and cool, and I've used some of those. I like them. Mm hmm Just something that you haven't seen very much of, but... Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So that's fonts. Fonts. And ampersands. <laughs> um, what do you want to go on to next? Should we uh, talk about Lake Street Dive? Sure. Sounds cool. Uh, okay, so Lake Street Dive is actually... Um, a band that I found out about from my sister and I'm really glad that she tipped me off to them because they are super interesting. Um, they're a four-piece band. They actually went to school together. They met at um, the New England Conservatory in Boston and uh, the band was put together by this guy, I think it was Mike Olson, who did it. He like hand-selected these three other people to be in his band. Um, it's fronted by this wicked singer named Rachel Price. Um, she's kind of got this, I want to say gravelly, but it's really smooth voice and she just belts it. It's so good. And they have a, a chick bass player, Bridget Kearney, 
who also is just holding it down in the low end section. And this other guy named Mike, forgive me if I mispronounce his last name, Calabrese. Um, yeah, so super tight four piece. Uh, the first video I saw of them online was a cover of Jackson 5, I Want You Back. And you can find it on YouTube. Maybe we'll play a clip of it in here. But they're just standing on a sidewalk out in some neighborhood. Oh, cool. Just playing like really simple instrumentation. And it's so good. Like it's one of those songs that you just watch and you watch again and again and again because you can't believe how talented these people are. Um, they are putting out, or they might have already put it out, I think it's already out, um, this album called Bad Self Portraits. Um, it's probably the one that's getting the most attention right now. They had two other albums, one in 2011, which was a self-titled album, and in 2012 they put out this one called Fun Machine. I think, uh, Fun Machine, like, I think their other releases have a lot more covers incorporated into them, whereas Bad Self Portraits has a lot of originals, which is really cool about this band. All of the members in the band write the songs. It's not just Rachel who's doing all the writing, so it's neat to have that diversity in coming out of one band with their songwriting. Um, they've been performing together for almost 10 years, which is pretty crazy in today's music world because most bands don't normally last that long. Yeah. Um, so to kind of just be hitting the big time now and to have already been together for 10 years, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah. And they're still so young. Like, yeah. people would get out, give up. Actually, I'm not quite sure how old they are, but they look really young. Um, yeah, really cool, kind of jazzy, soul music. Um, it's just, it's really cool. Um, they're a really big song right now that's getting a lot of uh, airplay on CBC Radio 2 is a song called You Go Down Smooth. And actually, I'd like to play that one because it's a song that sounds like you've heard it a million times. Something about it sounds very familiar, but the way that they do it sounds really new and fresh and really exciting too. Oh, so cool. yeah, I really like their music. I, I like the style. It's not something that everybody's doing right now. I mean, maybe once they become really popular, all these other bands will come out of the woodwork that sound just like them. But yeah. for them being kind of, I don't want to say the pioneers, but like the the band that's out right now that's kind of the only band like it. Really special stuff. Um, they're currently signed to an indie label called Signature Sounds. I checked out the Signature Sounds website uh, when I was doing my research on them and they've got a couple like really interesting acts signed to them. So if you've got time, check out Signature Sounds and uh, the other artists on their roster. But back to Lake Street Dive, New York Music Daily calls them the future of pop music, so if you're paying attention to the pop world, you definitely should check out Lake Street Dive because apparently this is where pop music's going, and I think that's a great thing. I think it's great that people are taking chances with popular music, and, and instead of sticking with the formula that we're all so used to hearing, they're kind of branching out and playing with different instruments, and, and uh, yeah, it's just refreshing. So. We're going to play for you a tune by Lake Street Dive. This one's called You Go Down Smooth. So that was Lake Street Dive. Pretty cool. Um, let us know what you think about them on our Facebook page. Yeah. So, up next, I was talking last week about animated GIFs, or GIFs, as they're apparently supposed to be called, and I came across an article on, well, it was linked on Art F City, which is a New York art website that I check out every once in a while, and it was, this article was on, um... Art News, I think, um, something like that, and it's by Patty Johnson. She happens to be from Guelph, Ontario, which is where I did my undergrad and some of my family is from, um, but she's made a name for herself as a critic in New York and is actually the founder of Art F City, cool. so it's cool to see like 
people from Ontario, where we're from, like, making it big in the art world. <laughs> Is this, like, a huge website that a lot of people in that side of arts know about? Um, I'm not sure. I found a bit at a... <laughs> um, I found out about it through people I work with at the museum, so obviously other artists know about it. <laughs> okay. that I'm, I'm trying to keep it together, come on. <laughs> keep it together. Uh, so yeah, um, anyway, Patty Johnson, <laughs> sounds awesome, um, and she has started a three-part series about the history of the animated GIF. I'm going to keep calling it GIF. I like GIF better. Yeah, me too. Um, so she started this three-part history of animated GIFs in art, which I think is really awesome. I don't think there's anything like that out there yet, and it's something that she mentions. Because there have been more and more um, exhibitions that include animated GIFs, but there doesn't seem to be much documentation of those exhibitions, so it's hard to follow where the animated GIF is and fits into art history. Mm -hmm. So she's trying to piece that all together and look at really influential animated GIFs as far as the art world goes, which <laughs> seems ridiculous. Um, but I think it's really important, and I know that I didn't get to study animated GIFs at all through my four years in my program, even though I was working with them a lot, so I think this is really important. Like, it's something that's happening right now in art history, and it's a medium that's used a lot by artists now, but we don't have any sort of history of it um, to look back on, so... That's neat. You're kind of in the first wave of it. Yeah. But that's also, I that guess, definitely why they probably don't talk about it in schools, because it's still so fresh, they don't really... Right. It's not really to talk about it yet. Because <laughs> they only sort of started in, like, the early 90s, so it hasn't been that long. Yeah. Um, and there's insane stuff happening, like, amazing artistry going into some of these animated gifts. And then there's also another side of it where artists are appropriating gifts that they see online that aren't created for any sort of art purpose. So they're like almost curating animated gifts that they find that are made just for Tumblr and Reddit and stuff. Wow. You know? So yeah. it's it's interesting. It's a it's a cool time to be a digital artist. <laughs> making gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah, wait, so going back to that so we'll put the link. What was it? Art F I found it through Art F City, but I think it was actually on Art News, or it was Art Net News, I think. I'll definitely include the link for it. I just didn't write it down. Um, that's pretty cool. If, uh, if any of you guys are making some neat gifts, send us the link, because we like to check out interesting things like that, too. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, moving along. Uh, the second band that I'm going to talk about is a band that I think is really neat, and I know I probably say that about every band that I'm going to talk about, but <laughs> probably because I just think they're all neat. Um, so this one's the Devin Cuddy Band. Uh, he's from Toronto, a Toronto native there. Um, the Devin Cuddy Band is the full name of, of the band, it's not just Devin Cuddy. Um, this is a CD I actually picked up, I went to their CD release party. This one came out in 2012, it's called Volume 1, and uh, any day now actually is he's going to be putting out a follow-up called Kitchen Knife, which I haven't heard any samples of yet, but I'm really excited to listen to it. Um, Devin, if you couldn't guess by his last name, is the son of Jim Cuddy from Blue Rodeo, and when you read any articles on him, I think that kind of overshadows who he is as an artist in his own right. Because if you listen to his music, it's nothing like Blue Rodeo. So, I mean, obviously you get noticed because of who you know and who you are. And if your dad is, you know, Canadian rock royalty, then then people will be more interested or, or whatever it is. But um, Devin's music is really cool, really original. I want to call it like rolling rock. It's like New Orleans-y, jazzy kind of 
bluesy. They almost, when I saw them, they kind of reminded me of the band a little bit. Um, again, you won't hear anybody else like him right now. This music is really original. Um, I give him credit for his songwriting because he talks about some really interesting things in his lyrics. He's got one song um, called Afghanistan. And if you listen to it, <laughs> you're thinking, how would anybody ever think to write a song about this? And there's one called My Son's a Queer. That's not a usual song topic, but he does it. And he does it so well. Like These songs are really catchy. It's one of those ones that I put in when I'm driving and before I know it, it's over. Um, yeah, Devin Cuddy Band is a four-piece band. Uh, their guitar player is a guy named Nicole Robertson. Robertson? Yeah. Uh, Devin, I should say, plays the, the piano and uh, just rocks it. You don't see anyone playing piano anymore that's the lead singer of a band. Uh, bass player is a guy named Devin Richardson, very talented, and on drums there's Zach Sutton. And these guys are really fun to watch because you can tell that they're really good friends too and there's just a camaraderie between them. Um, when I saw them play it was at the Cameron House and this record and the follow-up Kitchen Knife actually is coming out on Cameron House Records. The bar itself has kind of started up their own indie oh, label, cool. which is really neat. They've got some other artists on there too which I'm forgetting right now, um, but they're all good. I've listened to them all, but uh, that one was the only one whose CD release party I've been to. And uh, yeah, they're just really different, and I like that, because sometimes I get tired of listening to the same kind of, I don't want to say generic, but you know, that typical pop, really hooky stuff. I mean, I love it. I love it a lot. But this is, this is poppy in its own way. It's, uh, it's really cool. Uh, I think that was all I had. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll throw in a uh, Devin Cuddy video for you to check out right now. Um, awesome. Enjoy. <laughs> commercial things. Last week I mentioned the digital art auction where they are auctioning off digital artworks. Now I want to talk about online auctions. So this is not necessarily selling digital art, though it could be. It's selling sort of all art. So um, Amazon is linked to over 300 galleries now, so they'll have online art auctions. And there's also a new service coming out called Wanderer. Um, I'll put the link in. And um, the idea there is that some people are just getting into art collecting and there are also new artists out there who sort of need the support. They need art sales in order to keep their art practice running. So services like this are intended for smaller art purchases. Um, I don't think they would turn down huge art sales. But people just getting into collecting aren't necessarily going to Sotheby's auctions where there are like million dollar pieces being sold. So these online art auctions allow for smaller sales, support of smaller artists, um, and stuff like that. So I thought that was really cool. Um, in the interview that I read, they were estimating that online art auction sales are likely to like quadruple in the next few years mm -hmm. um, as people are looking to support smaller artists and finding art online and stuff. So I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, they said that average sales are definitely a lot lower than your like live auctions in person. Um, they're averaging about 500 to $2,000 per That's interesting. artwork. interesting. I wonder why. I guess it's easier to shop online. Mm -hmm. you know? e easier to find the stuff you want. But I think also art is an investment, right? So mm -hmm. um, people generally want to see it in person. Like even if you're buying over the phone, usually there's a representative who's looking at the work or you've seen the work in person already. Like it's different buying art online because if it's a painting, you can't see the texture, you know? Yeah. You can only see the colors. So it's interesting. I'm excited to see where this goes. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, I feel like also more people are just buying art in general. Like, 
there's more money in, within their budget that they want to spend on pieces. Like, my room right now has, it's not like paintings, but I have tons of pictures, and I used to never have pictures, but all of a sudden, I want pictures around. Like, mm -hmm. it's like a weird thing, and um, in our town, we do this thing annually called Starry Night, and it's a evening, it happens in the evening, it's an open walk through all of the art galleries downtown and, mm -hmm. and the stores too. Studio studio and like, open as well. Yeah, and it's a really cool opportunity for local artists that might not get their work seen on like a bigger scale. It's a neat mm -hmm. opportunity for them to have people come walk through. And from what I hear, like a lot of people walk away with pieces. Like, that's interesting. Mm hmm. For, I think yeah that's great yeah. yeah I mean it's not online sales but it's uh but still supporting people. small town yeah artists and stuff yeah um yeah so that was uh we we're just talking about the starry night is it a festival or what's it called starry night I don't know if it art walk yeah something like that starry night at art walk or it's really cool starry night Guess that's all we have for today. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thanks for watching episode two of yeah. the Arts District. Um, like we said at the beginning, we're still getting the ball rolling on this. So if you like what you're seeing or you want to help support us, then share it around. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to keep doing this as often as we can and hopefully enlighten you guys on what's happening in arts and, and local events and whatnot. If you have stuff that you want us to talk about that we aren't aware of that you think would be neat, send us some information through our Facebook page. We also have an email account, um, the Arts District Podcast at gmail dot com. Um, yeah, yeah, it's all on Facebook, so just find us there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.